This is me, on my first day of playing top lane. Yeah, I'm the Renekton, in case you had to ask. I clearly have absolutely no idea what I'm doing, and to call me trash would be an insult to the dumpsters behind McDonald's everywhere. And this right here, well, this is me only one week later, solo killing enemy laners like it's nothing. Tower diving for solo kills off early leads, and pulling the enemy jungler into 1v2s and hard carrying the game. So how do I go from looking boosted to a smurf with 100 CS for level lead in such a short period of time? Well, that's exactly what you'll be learning by the end of this guide, the secrets to improving at an insanely fast rate. Now, this video is part of a bigger series where I document my climb to diamond in under 30 days. You see, I've never played top lane before. I've never even played top lane champions before. In reality, I'm a filthy jungle main whose elo is inflated due to my overpowered role. So you're probably wondering, why on earth would I consciously subject myself to solo queue with this challenge? Well, it's actually inspired by you guys. I have a unique opportunity, since I'm so horrendous at top lane, to show exactly how a player who is terrible at the game and completely clueless can then, within 30 days, achieve the rank of diamond. I've even gone so far as to record live commentaries throughout this entire process, so you can follow me on my journey to diamond step by step. In them, I teach you how to review your replays, how to identify what mistakes you're making. Essentially, you'll be able to see in real time the step-by-step -step process of how someone actually improves at the game that you can then copy and get results with. If this wasn't enough, we even have the next two episodes in this series already live on our website, skillcap.com. So if you find this guide useful, and trust me, you will, then you need to unlock the full course that took over a month to create by clicking that discount link in the description below. All right, now let's get back to watching me suffer. Now, if I wasn't already hating having to spend a month of my life grinding solo queue, my friends here at Skillcap have made sure I can't cheat during this challenge. No using top tier overpowered champions to quickly climb the ladder. No, 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 that would be too uh, nice of them. Instead, I've been assigned, drum roll please, Renekton. Quite literally, one of the worst top lane champions on the patch as he had a 45% win rate when I picked him. Yeah, thanks guys, really helping me out here. All right, so day one of my climb to diamond begins, and you're probably exactly like me and wondering, where do I even start? Well, when it comes to starting your journey climbing the ranks of League of Legends, it always has to start with this one first step. You need to win your lane. By winning your lane, you unlock the opportunity to carry through good macro later on. Compare that to if you lose lane, you'll always be on the back foot, playing reactive and just hoping the enemy throws. Additionally, players diamond and below simply aren't that good at laning, and so you should be able to win lane pretty much regardless of the matchup once you get good enough, due to the sheer amount of mistakes they make and acquire a big enough lead to then begin carrying once that laning phase ends. This is also a very important lesson when it comes to learning in general. You need something digestible, something small, but a clear objective you can apply yourself to. In this case, knowing that my objective is to always win my lane, well, then it becomes much more obvious on where I should focus my attention. So let's begin. The laning phase always starts at level one, and so that's what I need to first fully master. And how do I do this? Well, I go to our skill capped courses, then select laning. I decide to watch our how to stomp your lane course. The first video in that course has a great introduction to controlling the lane at level one. Let's listen in. The most important thing you need to consider every single game before making your game plan is to analyze who can get the early wave advantage. In top, you'll find yourself in melee versus melee matchups more often than any other role. What this means is that a minion advantage is super important, especially early on. Whichever player has more minions will usually win trades during the early levels simply because you have to get up close and personal to trade. During those very early levels where champions are still weak, this means that minions will have a relatively much higher impact than later on in the game. This will usually come down to matchup experience, but to have a good idea of whether you can get early lane control over your opponent, you just need to ask yourself the following. Do I have a wave clear advantage with an AoE ability? Do I have the range advantage to pressure my opponent off the wave? Will I or my opponent have to leash for our junglers? Typically, the side that doesn't have to leash can get an early start pushing the wave. Or am I playing versus a powerful early lane bully? Okay, so I understand getting the early push is important, and that what will determine who has the push lead is based on how their abilities interact. So let's just jump right into one of the first games I played and see how I handle this in real time. Since I have no experience with not only my own champion, but also the enemy champion, I have to actually look up what these champions do, their ability ranges, damage, cooldowns, etc. From doing this, I draw one main thing about Camille. She lacks wave clear as her only real AoE ability is her W, which is on a 17 second cooldown. Compare that to my Q, which is also AoE, but has a 7 second cooldown. 
So heading into the game, I now have the very basic plan of getting the push advantage and that it should work out due to my superior level one wave clear. Something else I learned that was very important was when I went to our courses on matchups and in our melee versus melee course, the first video talks about the following. She starts using her Q on the minions. As soon as she does that, I now have control of the lane like we talked about. She can no longer contest anything that I do. My Q cooldown is very short and notice I've only used it to poke her. I haven't used it on any minions. Riven using her Q on minions with it being a much longer cooldown than mine is a big mistake. But even when I watch Loi Lo Yone players, they do the same thing. They think they are just stacking up their tornado. No, 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 that's all wrong. Just because something is a short cooldown doesn't mean you can just use it whenever. So just because my Q is on a lower cooldown doesn't mean I should just spam it on the wave. I try my best to use it when Camille is in range so I can both damage the minions and the enemy champion at the same time. By following these two basic strategies, I've now established the push lead. In that very same video, our challenger expert McBays then goes on to teach about the importance of level 2 timing windows. After this, I see Riven walk from the far brush to this middle one. I immediately knew what was going to happen from here. Her doing that was a very aggressive move. She's putting herself right next to me basically. The thing is, she shouldn't be posturing aggressively at all. I have control of the lane and this brings us to core concept number 3, which you have heard plenty of times, but even in plat, these players still don't have this down. Core concept number three is level two advantage. You need to be tracking level two every single game, literally. If you or the enemy ever hit level two and you weren't 100% prepared for it and ready for it, you don't have the concept down. You should know every single time right before they hit level two. It decides so many lanes, it's crazy. You have to be able to do this or you can't progress. So with my early push lead, I know I'm going to hit level two and I make sure to posture aggressively so that I can immediately engage once I do. And by following this, I'm then able to get a winning trade. After this winning trade, the third wave arrives, Camille hits level two and I'm in what looks to be a terrible position pushed up the lane. But luckily I've actually watched videos on laning fundamentals at Skillcat. For example, in this video, we teach exactly what to do while in this position. But anyways, getting back to the Jax vs Kane gameplay, McBase was starting to work on the third wave and finishing his slow push army of minions. He's going to jump on Kane and trade a bit because like we talked about, since McBase is pushing, he will win the trades. But after that, he focuses on the CS again as he wants to hit level 3 for the level advantage. As soon as he does, he jumps in on Kane and chunks him with his Q and W, then turns on E. The E here is actually really important. The reason for that is you need to make sure you fully clear the cannon quickly so your slow push hits the enemy tower. If not, some minions might get into tower range and the tower will basically freeze the wave. So McBase uses E to quickly clear the rest of these minions. Now this is when the cheater recall we talked about earlier takes place. After stacking the waves and crashing it, you recall. Now Kane has to clear a big wave under tower and the wave will be slow pushing back towards McBase afterwards. This means Kane has only two options, either recall and TP back to lane so he doesn't miss CS from the wave slow pushing or stay and crash the wave on McBase's tower before resetting. The problem with this is McBase is going to be able to reset and grab some kind of item, longsword, cloth armor, whatever it is and will have full potions. Also, he doesn't need to TP back to lane. So, McBase will have the item advantage with Kane pushing into him. This can be dangerous for Kane, so he has to choose carefully. If you have been paying attention, it should be obvious by now that he will have to slow push three waves in to McBase's tower to give him the best chance of survival here. This is what we mean when we say that top lane is all about slow pushes. So, I know in this position, I need to crash this third wave as fast as possible and then recall, buy some items and head back to lane. Let's hop into my live commentary to get an idea of what I'm thinking while I'm doing this. I think I'm just gonna do a cheater recall. I'm aware of that strategy. Now oh, that's a thing. I think it's perfectly fine. I have a buy as far as getting a longsword. Grab a pink ward. Again, I don't even know if any of this is true. This is all stuff that we teach in our videos. Um, I've watched many top lane guides. And so, you know, the cheater recall strategy is a very prominent strategy. We recommend the idea that, you know, you get the push lead in the first three waves. It's all just very standard stuff you can apply to like any champion. Um, and then I'm just trying to, uh, I'm trying to learn how to accomplish it with Renekton and how it feels as Renekton to do that kind of stuff. Now, there's one final concept I learned in that same video. This is what we mean when we say that top lane is all about slow pushes, but let's see what happens. McBase gets back to lane and Kane has a level advantage, but McBase has the health plus item advantage. McBase knows that Kane will be slow pushing and if he waits too long to try and fight, Kane's minion wave will eventually be too big to fight him. So he jumps in right away and goes all in. Sadly, when he jumped in and went for an auto into W to finish him off, it gets cancelled mid-animation from Kane's flash. But you can see how the cheater recall put McBase in a really good spot to kill the Kane here. 
So as I get back to lane, I know I want to try and go aggressive with my item lead, but I don't fully understand how to do it. Like Camille is up a level on me and has a big wave, so I'm hesitant to just jump in. Once these last few minions of mine die, and the next wave comes in, I try to thin out the enemy wave with my abilities and auto attacks, but it really doesn't accomplish that much. Eventually, I just accept the fact that I need to do what the video taught me, and just go in and see what happens. And what you know, it works, and I win the trade. And with the wave now frozen in front of my tower, I just wait for my cooldowns to come back up, and all in the Camille off it, and get myself a solo kill and a big lead. Now, the previous example was great in terms of just a bread and butter execution of what was taught in the videos, but you're probably just like me and will make this very one common mistake, mistiming your crash. In this game, I'm facing a Darius, and just like the Camille game, I got control of the lane at level 1. I built up a slow push, and the third wave arrives. As we just learned, I should be hard shoving this wave at this point in order to set up my recall, but notice how I kind of just hesitate and, in general, am just slow on executing the push. Because of this, by the time the wave crashes, the next wave has already arrived and so it's far too late for me to recall. It will be quite easy for Darius to just clear the wave, shove it into our tower, and match our recall. And we wouldn't even get to our tower in time to then pick up the CS, it would just be a negative play for us. I actually ended up realizing this in the game. Could cheat a recall, but I don't think we pushed it fast enough. So just like in the Camille game, the wave is rebounding back to me, but I don't have that item advantage from recalling like I should. Despite this, I try to do the same thing I did in the Camille game. I go aggressive and fight Darius, which is just a terrible idea, and I end up throwing my lane and dying solo. This goes to show how what may seem like a very small mistake to you, not pushing that third wave as fast as possible, ends up actually being the exact reason why the strategy doesn't work. And this perfectly transitions into my next point. If there's one piece of advice I could give you guys, is that you need to be able to push yourself to play aggressive and learn your limits. For example, in this clip, I'm facing a Riven. I've never played the Riven matchup, and I don't know who's allowed to control the wave at level 1. She trades into my whole minion wave at level 1, and I continue to try and implement the same strategy of getting early lane control thinking everything is fine. Whenever she aggressively trades into my minion wave, I stand my ground thinking my minions would be enough to win me the fight, but it isn't, and I die level 1 like a complete noob. It's so important that you understand deaths like this are inevitable if you truly want to climb and get better. If I just sit back and play passive into every matchup, I'll never know in what matchups I can get the level 1 push and which ones I have to concede it to the enemy. The only way for me to truly master the concepts we teach here at Skillcapped is to be willing to fail and then learn from that failure. For example, in the Riven matchup, I now know don't just stand and trade with her, she has more sustained damage level 1. In the future, maybe I can try to land Q poke and then just kite to my wave. Maybe I could try and go aggressive on her longer Q cooldown, since my Q is actually shorter. But one thing I definitely know now is that I shouldn't just stand there and let her land a full Q combo on me, even if I have the minion wave. Here's another example of the importance of limit testing. In this game, I'm facing a Pantheon with Ignite, and so on the surface, I do think I lose this 1v1, and so I should concede the early level 1 control. However, this is the first time I've ever played this matchup. I'm going to see whether I can be the one to control the lane. I default to aggression. I follow the same strategy of looking to get a minion lead with auto attacks and landing my Q to poke the enemy and damage the minions at the same time. When my Q is on cooldown, I back off. Except when he's moving aggressively in my minion wave, I want to trade back to see if I do in fact win the trade with a minion lead. The second wave arrives, and I look to auto the minions as much as possible to spike level 2, and an extremely close fight then unfolds and I barely get the solo kill on him. Here's the thing, I did not play this perfect, and he didn't either. For example, there were plenty of instances that I was able to dodge his Q to avoid damage, which obviously was a huge reason I survived the later all-in. That's not always going to happen. Additionally, Pantheon could have consumed his Corrupting Potion stacks earlier to be higher in health when the all-in happened, or I could have just misused my flash and not dodged his Q, and just died 1v1 anyways. The point is, it's not about the results, it's about trying the strategy and analyzing what both players could have done better, and whether the outcome would have stayed the same. In this case, it's obvious Pantheon could have played a lot better, and so I don't believe I could replicate the solo kill against a better Pantheon, and so I'm aware I'll probably have to switch to conceding level 1 lane control to Pantheon in a future higher rank. With that being said, still, I'll play aggressive in the next Pantheon I face until they actually prove they can shut me down in whatever rank I'm playing in. Now, you're probably thinking, that's all cool when you have control of the wave level 1, but what about the matchups where you didn't get control level 1? Well, after inting, or sorry, I mean limit testing, into a Jax matchup a few too many times, I finally learned that there's no way I can get control of the lane at level 1 over him. So let's show how to properly play it. On the first wave, I sit back and let him push. I try to go up to last hit when possible, but I'm okay with getting zoned from minions if he goes aggressive on me. Essentially, from past limit testing, I've learned that fighting back when Jax has his E up and passive fully stacked is a terrible idea. And so giving up control of the lane level 1 means I will also have to be willing to give up CS here and there. 
The minions eventually crash into my tower, and this is such an important moment in top lane. You see, if there's really only one lesson you take away from this guide, it's the following. Top lane is just taking turns slow pushing. I actually learned this exact concept from our wave control course on slow pushing, so let's listen. Because top is such a long lane, it lets you stack up a lot of minion waves if you push slowly. Creating a big wave has multiple benefits. It gives you a big experience advantage and a huge wave to fight for you if you trade or get ganked. This is exactly how a lot of top laners 1v2 the enemy laner and jungler. The enemy jungler ganks into a big wave and the minions are enough to turn the tide. Big wave can lead to multiple different plays as well. In high elo, top laners will stack up three waves then dive the enemy top with their jungler. And just like that, the game is really, really difficult. And that brings us to another very important point. If the enemy top laner is slow pushing to you, you have to avoid taking bad trades, as you can be dove solo or by the enemy jungler. And if you lose all the CS from the slow push, the lane is completely done. So with this in mind, the next time I see Jax, I look to aggressively trade. I know I have the big wave to back me up, and I'm really just trying to get Jax low enough that maybe I could dive him like they said in the guide. By the time the wave crashes though, I didn't get enough damage on the Jax to dive, so I just recall. Now, check this out. In the matchup I had against Camille, I was able to do a very similar strategy. I built up a big wave, crashed it, recalled, got an item advantage, and then when I came back I fought her to try and thin the wave, set up a freeze, and then all in with my item advantage. So I figured, I'd do the same thing against Jax, build up the big wave, recalled off the crash, got an item lead, and now I'm ready to trade, thin out the wave, freeze it, and kill Jax. But there is one key difference, Jax is way more powerful than Camille in the early levels. So instead, what happens is exactly what was taught to me about how top lane is turn-based around slow pushes. I went aggressive when Jax had the wave advantage, and now I have to learn my lesson and get tower dove and lose the big wave in the process. And it's this moment here, this is what I would define as matchup knowledge. You see, I was taught two fundamental concepts in top lane. The first is, whoever has the push lead is the aggressor, and the other player should play passive. This was correct in the Jax matchup. The second concept was the cheater recall. If you get an item lead, you can set up an all-in when the enemy pushes back. This was correct in the Camille matchup. What's left for me to learn is not only in what matchups I can apply either of these strategies, but also what about the matchups cause it to work or not work. For example, yes, Jax is strong early on due to his lethal tempo rune giving him a ton of attack speed and his E ability blocking auto attacks and minion damage and all of that stuff. But check this out. When I'm walking back to lane, notice how Jax is spam auto attacking the wave. He's building up his passive stacks for max attack speed when he does fight me, while also building up a bigger wave for himself. These are actually signals that I probably can't beat him 1v1 with my item advantage. Now, compare this to the Camille, who yes, is a weaker early game champion compared to Jax, but also didn't auto the wave, and so had less minions built up, and more time for me to thin out the wave, and equalize in levels, etc. So, when I find myself in another Jax matchup, if I cheat a recall and head back to lane with an item advantage, I'll be sure to check if he's autoing the wave or not. If he doesn't, well, it means he doesn't have his passive stacked, and I have more time to thin out the wave, and will likely kill him 1v1 like I did with Camille. This is a really good example of how someone would take fundamental theory, and then turn that into more matchup specific theory. Okay, so you now have a good idea on how these first few waves play out based on who has control of the wave early on, but I want to show you guys something I learned that really surprised me. You see, I thought top lane would be me level 2 spiking on opponents and just solo killing them super easy. In reality, a lot of players just played passive as soon as I got early control of the lane. They really didn't fall for that. And instead, the majority of my lane winning leads were actually coming from collapsing on enemy junglers. Let me explain. So, here's a matchup I played into Darius. I get the early push lead, get level 2 before him, and Darius, surprise surprise, just sits out of my range and plays passive. Let's be honest, this looks like I'm doing nothing, like I'm getting no lead at all. But since I'm the one with control of the lane and pushing him into the tower, I'm able to go and put a ward down and react to any jungle fights first. I'm able to convert that early lane control into reacting first to the jungle fights while he's pinned to the tower. I'm thus able to pick up a double kill and double buffs for a lane winning lead. Essentially, a big breakthrough moment was that junglers are kind of low-key brain dead and don't respect a lane priority at all in Diamond and Below. Here's another example of this. I'm playing Renekton into Quinn, a ranged matchup. This is all very standard, we have tons of guides on this. Since I'm facing a ranged champion, I have to concede control of the lane level 1 and let them push. Quinn crashes the wave, and what do you know? My jungler decides to fight in the river, despite me completely lacking lane priority, and Quinn picks up a kill and double buffs. Obviously, there's nothing I can do about this, but it just goes to show you just how important it is to get control of the lane level 1 when you can. You'll not only set yourself up for solo kills on the enemy, but you'll also set yourself up to get easy kills on the enemy jungler. 
So all of this sounds great and like you could just leave it here, but guess what? The last thing I learned was how easy it is to throw your lane when you're pushing, and it's all due to one very easy war timing nearly every player missed. For example, here I'm facing Aatrox. On the first wave, I'm fighting for control of the wave, and to get that push lead as we taught earlier. The second wave arrives, I look to see if I can level 2 all in, and then default to zoning and building up my slow push. It's here as the third wave arrives that the war timing exists. You see, nearly every jungler can't gank you prior to the 2 minute and 45 second timing due to how jungle pathing works. Notice how in top lane, right as the third wave arrives, I don't have any last hits. All the minions are full health since it's a brand new wave. Additionally, look at the in-game time. It's 2 minutes and 40 seconds. It's right as the third wave arrives, you need to go place a ward when you're the one pushing. You can see that by placing that ward down, I'm able to spot the enemy Wukong ganking me on that very standard timing, which then prevents me from dying to that gank. Now compare this to when I'm facing an enemy who has lane control at level 1. Here I'm facing an Olaf who's just insanely strong in the early levels, so I let him push into me as we taught earlier. Now notice how when the third wave arrives, he's completely unaware of that ward timing and just continues to play aggressive. And what do you know, I literally did nothing but sit back and play passive, and then I win my lane off the most standard jungle gank timing ever. It sounds incredibly silly, but this one ward timing by itself will determine whether you throw your lead if you're the one pushing, or net you free kills if you're the one playing passive. So, to recap, in this first week, I made sure to start by focusing on winning lane. This will set me up for carrying in the future. Since laning starts at level 1, that's where I first began focusing my attention, mastering those first few levels. Every matchup starts with the question of, who has control over the lane at level 1? When I have control, I make sure to build up a slow push and zone the enemy from the wave with the threat of aggressive trades with my minion and level lead. I also make sure to place a ward before the 2 minute and 45 second gank timing, which coincides with the third wave arriving. This is the most common way you and your enemies will throw their lane, dying to this very standard gank timing. As I then continue pushing, I look for opportunities to collapse on the enemy jungler if they decide to fight my jungler in the river, as I can react first given the enemy will be pinned to their tower by that big wave. If this doesn't happen, and I'm not able to get a solo kill, I just crash that third wave and set up a recall timing off it and walk back to lane with an item lead. Into weaker matchups that aren't aggressively pushing the wave, I look to trade into them and thin out the wave to then set up a freeze and solo kill them with my item lead. Into stronger matchups are players who are pushing and building up a bigger minion lead, I have to play passive and let the wave crash to avoid dying and losing a huge wave to my tower. Now that we have some basic fundamentals down, next week we'll be diving deeper into generating early leads and the tricks to snowballing them even further to truly crush your lane. Now I'm sure you're wondering what to do next. But keep in mind, this is just the first episode of Climbing to Diamond in 30 Days. We actually have the next two episodes already live. To unlock them, you just need to head to our website skillcap.com. Not only will you get all the episodes in this series, but I've even gone so far as to record live commentaries throughout this entire process so you can follow me on my journey to Diamond step by step. I demonstrate how to review replays, how to identify what mistakes you're making, Essentially, you'll be able to see in real time the step-by-step -step process of how someone actually improves at the game that you can then copy and get results with. This one course took us over a month to create and is essential if you want to improve and see results. So click the discount link in the description below to unlock the full course. We here at Skillcapped want to thank you for watching and we'll catch you in the next one.